What's up, guys? In this episode of the Ask a Creator Economist podcast, we get three questions from three really cool creators. The first one is somebody who thinks that the creator economy is actually a pipe dream. They don't know how it's possible to even succeed in it. Uh, the second question comes from a creator who is unsure whether to launch their own website or to try something like the Unify fan platform. Um, and the third person is a basketball coach, and they're not really sure how to monetize and ask their audience to start paying for subscriptions or for premium courses and stuff like that. And they don't really know how to tackle that. So we tackle all three of those questions in this episode. It's just me and Thomas this time. So Jonas is out at the moment, but um, yeah, we hope you guys enjoy the video. If you do want to submit some questions, head to unify.io slash podcast. You'll find it down below in the show notes. You can submit your question to us and we will answer it on the next episode. Hope you guys enjoy the video and we hope you have a good one. All right, Thomas. So we have here question one comes from a Filippo or Filippo. I'm going to go ahead and read Filippo's question. It's actually more of a comment. And here's what Filippo said. Hot take. The creator economy is overrated. For most people, making it their living as a creator is a pipe dream. Filippo is a blogger. And he did not give us any of his URLs or any of his information. He does talk about the digital economy. And uh, Filippo has some pretty, pretty, common, um, pretty common issues or some pretty common sentiment about the creator economy. I think that's just the sentiment that a lot of people have about a lot of different things. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and take this question then, Thomas. So Filippo asks that says that the creator economy is a pipe dream. I think that the creator economy is really just an ecosystem, right? And it's, it's basically, it provides the tools for creators to succeed and to create a business on their own as a solo creator, right? So that's what the creator economy is in a nutshell. That means that anyone can succeed, but it doesn't necessarily mean everyone will succeed. The same way anyone can become an NBA basketball player or the best player ever, but that doesn't mean that everyone will, right? So... It requires a little bit of finesse. It requires some skill. It requires some luck. And I think my main ways to to or, or my main tips for you guys to uh, how to how to succeed in the creator economy is create content consistently. Make sure that that content is quality and it's desired by your users. And create stuff that feels authentic. And make sure it's something that you're passionate about. And lastly, make sure you have some type of business goal in mind some way that you can monetize your skills or your content eventually. So those are like my key tips for you guys on how to succeed in the creator economy. Again, as I mentioned, if, if something is set up, like the creator economy is an ecosystem. It's like, think of it like a concept, right? It's just the way the internet has evolved where we now have tools and services and platforms that just allow creators to succeed and kind of launch their own, their, their own business, right? So you can't really say that that's a scam, right? Because it's how you use it, right? It's think of it like a tool. Thomas, do you have any thoughts on that? I do have thoughts on it, but I think what what you said is pretty much on point. Hey, by the way, to to our listeners and to you, Ron, I'm suffering from a bit of a cough right now. So I try to be on point with my mute game. But if I don't make it all the time, apologies for this. But we thought better to give you to give you the dose of content, your your, your new shot of the Ace podcast than to not do it. So on, on, yeah. on to the question. I think like you, you mentioned passionate. I think it's also very important that, that it, it it is fun what you're doing because one thing is for sure. It's a it's a grind to succeed, and yeah, I mean, Filippo says like like for most it's a pipe dream, and that's potentially true, especially if like your reading is you make the money directly from your content. I do think that many people out there leverage content, but not necessarily going essentially in the media business, but other business models that they support with this. So, of course, an obvious example is consulting. Like most consultants publish stuff. They, by the way, always have been long before we had the term creator economy because back then they just wrote books or published articles in, in Harvard Business Manager or publications like this. And, and all kinds of service providers essentially nowadays create content. And I, I, I would say that is also part 
of the creator economy where content created, published, distributed online is really an integral part to many different business models. I mean, even in e-commerce, right, which is the, where the business model is selling stuff, like creators uh, with an audience have such an advantage that nowadays it's almost upside down. It's like we, we heard in the episode when we talked with Nicola that there are now companies who, who produce product, no-name product, and look for creators as the main as the main sales channel. So so that is the importance that that the creator economy nowadays has, just because it's where a large part of the population spends most of their time. You know what I think that large Thomas? parts of the populations will be stars. What do you think? I feel like the uh, distrust in like corporate has kind of led to like the increase or the the popularity of the creator economy. I think like for so long, people were always buying products that like corporations told us to buy. Right? It's like what, you, what commercials you saw on TV. The big the, whoever had the most money to buy the most advertising space or the most advertising minutes. Um, those are usually the products that would succeed. Right. And I think that what the creator economy has kind of given was like a voice to the authentic. Yeah. Like I said it in one of my tips that like create stuff that feels authentic to the people that you're creating stuff for, um, because that's what people kind of yearn for. That's what people really want in this day and age. Like they're done with the corporate, you know, the corporate uh, advertisements and commercials and corporate talking heads telling us, you know, what uh, pharmaceutical drug we're supposed to be taking. I don't know. I just think people want more like authentic voices. And that's why these are the types of voices that have so much, so much clout and so much like pull. That's why people are so scared of people like Joe Rogan, right? Definitely. Definitely. I, yeah. the, the phrasing that I always use is people trust people more than brands and they are more interested yeah. in, in people, frankly. And that is why people who can scale to the size of brands thanks to the internet and to the reach the distribution the internet gives individual voices they they are at a almost natural very humane advantage when it when when it comes to building building a business and yeah that is yeah. that that is this and then what you say about luck i would probably also double down on this right to, to make it as a content creator with longevity you definitely need luck then also luck sometimes means being at the right time at the right place which yeah you can put yourself in the right position to be or you can what's not that to. quote what's that quote you have w which one like I think you said it in the last podcast. There's like a, a famous quote where it's like, "Oh, about writing about your vice. and the and the muse." Yeah. Do you mean this one that's muse, yeah. a, a, allegedly said by by uh, Stephen King once? Like, like muse, the inspiration uh, knows where to find me because I'm at the desk at nine a.m. every day and I write. Yeah. And yeah, the the, yeah. the same goes for the creator economy. And by the way, it's not only I think consistency in creating is super important, and I think also networking reaching out to the right people that is also a very important part of the of the mm -hmm. second yeah of of course like in in most aspects of of life you had the nba comparison uh, very fittingly i think like not everybody will be a top superstar but you can still have you can still have fun doing so doing something that makes you smarter that makes a few people smarter and and helps in this way and then and then yeah. yes but i think what would be a good exercise actually i don't uh, think we need to uh, do it on the fly on this episode but really break down break down the creator economy business models that exist and that you can find out there to to give people some some more structured way to think about what they are doing and trying to achieve right because not like in in other industries it, not every business model fits every company and it doesn't fit every creator. So so being knowledgeable, and I think we mentioned this in, in past episodes before, at least we touched upon this, like so, some types of content and creation just lend themselves to, to advertising as a business model, to having partnerships, then others really work for premium content and asking people to pay if you have great advice in a niche that is that is valuable to people from from finance business and so on and then again 
others really really have content as a marketing tool essentially where they where they use it to get people to sell other stuff i mean what what are we doing here like we don't like to think about it this way because we are passionate about about the ace podcast but of course it is in some sense something we do because there is the product unify and the product unify we are we are happy if all of you use it and and more of you jump on and create their own platforms with it and and with in this podcast we also talk to this audience so so it's a very different business model than others but also something that that's certainly part of quote unquote the creator economy. Yeah, I mean, what percentage of all digital creators would you say do it just for the love of the game? You know, I think it's pretty low. I think most people have some type of like end result or business result that they like to achieve. Like think about it. You you start a little food vlog where you travel around and you you record yourself eating, you, you post them on TikTok. Wouldn't the dream to be wouldn't the dream to be to become a, a food influencer where you get paid to travel around and do it? So the reason I ask that, I don't literally want you to a- answer with a percentage, but I'm just saying like I think most people would welcome with open arms the uh, the prospect of them being able to monetize something that they love to do even if they had no intention of turning into a business. Now, Thomas, in under a minute, can you give me the five most popular, most known monetization strategies for digital creators? Try to make it, try to extend it to all the, all the different types of creators, whether it's YouTubers, Twitch streamers, uh, bloggers. What are like the five most common types of monetization strategies? So let's give it a try. The five most common monetization strategies that we see in the creator economy are actually two different types of advertising. One is really almost the old school approach of having ads via an ad server like AdSense on your stuff. It's also what YouTube creators very often do. The second advertising based business model in the creator economy is to work with individual brands partners so you have like ad reads on your podcast you have presenterships in your in your youtube clips then of course we have direct consumer business models the, the most prominent one certainly is subscriptions nowadays we are also seeing and actively build new ones like nft based and and token based micropayment based premium content and premium community interaction stuff so that is the direct to consumer angle then fourthly content as a marketing tool to sell other business uh, other services and maybe even other products and lastly we have um, the let's call it the co- consultant approach where you in the end are the product but in an individual client relationship that you want to have with somebody who is interested in your thinking in your theories and in your advice nice all right there those are your five most common monetization strategies uh, i think i think those are typically the most common you can probably apply those to most industries or most types of creators um, yeah. Anything else? Anything else on this question for Filippo? I guess we're good. I feel like Filippo, the, the, I guess the overall takeaway is like, um, the creator economy shouldn't be shunned or demonized because of its, uh, complexity to succeed in it. Right. I think like most things, it's just a technological advancement and an evolution of the internet, right? This, this transition from, read only to read and write to now read, create, monetize just an entire ecosystem, which is what we like to call Web3. Um, I think, you know, it's allowed people to just become very successful, start their own businesses. Doesn't mean you could just, you know, spray and pray and do whatever you want. And people will suddenly find your content and fall in love with what you do. I think that it does make sense to take somewhat of a business minded approach to it. Um, those are just my thoughts, my kind of closing thoughts on the matter, uh, approach it in, in a business savvy way, do, you know, be consistent, be honest, be authentic. And I think you can find success. 
I have one closing Thomas. thought because what popped to my mind is a study that I found a while ago and uh, I'm not 100% certain on the details, but a very high part of the teenage population, I think in the UK, it was, and I think it was around 90%, aspired when asked what they want to become when they are, when they are grown-ups, aspired to be creators. I think it was either specifically YouTubers or influencers, the wording, but essentially they aspired to be creators. And that, of course, is not going to work. Also, be be honest in your self-assessment. If you have what it takes to be a creator, because you need to set yourself apart from the millions of people publishing stuff online. So you need to be good. Then also practice yeah. makes perfect. So that goes back to your consistency angle. Three. Yeah. Yeah. They do say that um, true growth, especially, I'll, I'll just talk about YouTube specifically, that like you don't actually hit like a hockey stick growth of true like subscriber reach um, until you publish, I think, like 100 videos. Now, of course, that, you know, that number can be reduced based on the quality of the content, you know, how how good you make it, how good you start off, at, you know, from what, what level you start from. Um, but yeah, just I think consistency is, is a huge part of it, man, because most people just quit before they even get close to that, you know. True. That hockey stick level. All right, Filippo, thank you for your question. We hope that helps you. We're going to go ahead and move over to question two. And this one comes from Frank. Frank is a YouTuber, and he covers gaming and esports. And here is Frank's question. So far, I'm only on social media, but I've been thinking about my own website for quite a while. Now I discovered Unify. What would you say is the benefit of it versus a website, or would I need both? Frank, thank you for your question. That is a good question, and I will pass it over to Thomas. Why don't you go ahead and take it away, Thomas? Good question indeed. Let me give you a pretty precise and, and clear answer to this. So Unify is not a website in the sense that when I hear website, I think about a static page that has a certain layout that is maybe looking stylish in the last years we saw a lot of these scroll down big big area thingies where you want to convey static information this is me this is where you can reach me that's it and in unify you can create static pages and so on but that is not what the product is made for the product is made as a publishing solution where you can put your content online and as a community solution where you can connect with your with your audience so given that you are a youtuber when you speak about the website maybe what you're referring to is something where you can publish content where you have different options for your fan base and not just this digital business card type of thing in that sense because you also ask for what are the benefits versus a website. Well, it's a full-on publishing solution. It has all these community features, plus it has a lot of options to monetize your audience. You can sell subscriptions. You can sell digital goods based on NFTs. You can sell your own community currency. You can do a lot of things on the advertising side as well, integrate your, your partners, your sponsors. So it's really a toolkit for people with an audience who want to build their own business independently. And if that is your goal, then I think Unify is a much better choice than any website builder. That being said, if you kind of want both, and what we see with several of our clients, what they will do is they will have one of these website builders to have like a one-pager website so for for instance a squarespace a wix.com based one pager where they quickly tell you who are they what is their project and then they have a big link to their app their platform their community whatever they, they call it in the individual case and that is the unify and the way it would work is like the domain say migratedomain.com that is a wix page and then you you send everybody to your unify based interactive site that is a setup that we very often see yeah i just want to add something like i think um and if this isn't a term i think it should be but like the time to live 
So the time it takes for you to get to go from idea to I'm live and I'm creating content, it's less than any other service that I've used personally. I've used WordPress, I've used Wix, I've used Squarespace, I've used you know tons of these different web builders. Um, none of them can get you up and running faster than uh, than Unify. That's just to be candid. Um, out of box, WordPress is crazy cluttered, right? You 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 install WordPress after you get your domain. You set up your account on whatever you're using, Bluehost, whatever. Um, you install a theme, and it's a completely empty. Just you still have to download a theme, and the theme never looks like how it looks when you buy it, right? You go to these theme theme sites. You you see a theme that you really like. You install. You upload it. And you still have hours of work before you actually make it look like your own. Um, and yeah, that, I, I just think it's super easy to use for someone who, and I, I, as you said, that um, it's not quite like a real website, how you would imagine it. I think it's better because I think it removes a lot of the clutter because typically now when people create, especially content creators, if you're creating a website, dude, you don't want tons of pages that users have to navigate to. You don't. You want to concentrate the focus on the content, and I think that's what Unify does does best. Yeah. In addition to you know all the engagement features that come with it, out of box. Also. Agreed. And and so, one little yeah. insight into when we started building and how we still to this day build Unify. So we have a UX. If you're not familiar, that's user experience team that really starts with the mobile user experience as the starting point. So while there is also a web version and you can see it on the web, I think we we saw that mo the audience of most creators is a mobile first, sometimes even a mobile only audience. And Unify is really great for these mobile users because it just takes the best practices that you know from the big platforms out there where you're probably publishing most of your content nowadays and gives them to you so you can have all the same UX elements and more on your own on your own side. Hey, before we move to the next question, just a little uh, uh, sneak peek or, or we lift the curtains. What's the expression here, Ron? You lift the curtain? Yeah, peek behind the curtain. Yeah, of our production. So we want to play around a bit with the format of the ACE podcast here and what we will try in this episode and for a few other episodes is to keep it around or even below the 30 minute mark. So if you have thoughts on this, let us know. Do you like us to ramble for an hour or do you like the sharper, more concise version that we are experimenting with right now? Yeah, and to, to just package up what we mentioned about the Unify platform, if you are interested in checking it out, guys, head over to unify.io. You'll find that in the show notes. You can have a look at all the different instances and platforms that are already up and running that creators have already launched. Um, we have a couple of really cool clients that are creating some really cool stuff. So go ahead and check that out. And I say we move on to question three. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Question three comes from a Jamal. And Jamal is a coaching and educational YouTuber who does basketball videos. That's awesome. That is right up mine and Thomas's alley. Uh, Jamal, here's his question. We have been growing our educational YouTube channel for two plus years now. While the growth has been decent, we're hesitant to ask our fans to pay or offer them any type of premium offering. What are some ways we can begin to introduce the idea of paying for subscriptions? Jamal, that's a great question. I think that is a um, common you know, hesitation that a lot of creators or course creators have in general. It's like when to actually start asking their audience for money. You don't want to do it too soon because it might scare creators away. You don't want to do it too late because you might have missed that window where your leads or I'm sorry, your audience is the warmest, right? So Thomas, do you want to go ahead and take this one as well? Or Sure. Let me, let me begin. So first of all, I think it's never too early to start asking for payments, but If you do content that you want people to pay for, you need to do something different than if you do something that you want the maximum amount of people to see. 
that even goes back to the first question and the question of what is your business model. If you do something that is advertising based, then reach is really important because many brands and companies are mostly interested in your reach and maybe your reach within a specific niche or, or market segment. Then if you want people to pay for your content, what do you need to do? You need to think about your content as a valuable product and valuable to the user. So how can you provide value? It can be super insightful. People enjoy being smarter and they spend money on becoming smarter. It can be sound business advice that you are giving with your content. You can, of course, also do be super, super entertaining. I mean, there are, there are comedians and entertainers who sell premium content very successfully online. But whatever the type of value you provide is, that is what you need to uh, double down on and create a, a content product this way. And if that is what you do as a content creator, then probably it's even best to start asking people to pay from day one because you never get in the position where people are so used to your free stuff that they will then be super disappointed. There will be a lot of pushback from the community and so on. If you already have, like in your case, built a channel, have an audience and premium is new, then I think premium needs to add this value and be differentiated from what you have been doing. And I think one of the bigger risks is to get in a position where you say, I will do what I did before, but now you have to pay for it because then many people may leave and you may get pushback in the community because people don't enjoy it. Depends, right? If the stuff is, you say you do coaching and educational basketball content, so maybe you can even run a few experiments or, or ask your community if they would be willing to pay, what they would be willing to pay. But, but then when you start it, regardless of the timing, make sure that people understand what the added benefit is that they will get and why it's worth it to, to pay for it. There is another little angle, and this one should probably also go mentioned, something that many services do and many creators do, is they will position payment as an optional thing to say thank you. And this can work very well because people online can be very supportive. And if they enjoy your work, even if your content is free, but there is an easy option for them to pay something because they want to support you, want to support your work, this could even be a spin you could consider. Yeah, I just I, I kind of wanted to add on to what you said. Um, I think candor is probably my 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 favorite approach to this, right? So you're trying to figure out when you want to monetize your audience, whether you've already been creating content, really good educational stuff, or you haven't started yet. I think the approach that'll work for both of those is to just be honest with your audience. Tell them, hey guys. I've given you guys a lot of cool free stuff. I've tried to help my, my audience as much as I can. It would really help keep the dream alive or keep the, the projects coming if you guys would support, right? Be very candid with your audience. Or if you haven't begun yet, like Thomas said, start early by establishing the expectation early and say, hey guys, we're going to have educational free content. And in addition, we're going to add this premium stuff. So I think that's the least intimidating, least threatening way to do it, where ideally you don't lose any of your users after doing that, right? They're still going to get all the same content and all the same good stuff they've been getting. This is just an ad additional product line that can help you and, you know, monetize your business slowly. And then you just add to that premium product line, right? You just add more and more to it to try to entice more and more users. Think of it like a uh, a nurturing type of uh, activation. I have two. So that would be my my thoughts. I, I have two good examples that could really work for you, Jamal. So we just this week had a new creator launching his platform called thoroughbskating.com. I was going to mention him too. Oh, perfect. Yeah, Great. yeah. Awesome guy. Indeed. Like Victor, Victor Thorup, he's like an Olympic ice skater. And he has a YouTube channel where he already published a lot of uh, skating tutorials, practice and training tips and so on. 
And now he started on Unify. And one of the things he's doing on his Unify platform, of course, being a, a premium service, is to say, hey, you can, you can send me your videos. I will review them and give you personalized training tips. So that is, of course, something that takes time. It's a product that, that clearly has a value. And that is one thing that he does besides going even more in depth than he did on his YouTube channel into exercises. So if you are superficially interested in trying to, to train for skating, what he did and still does and will continue to do on YouTube might suffice. But if you really want to know the ins and out of a certain exercise and so on, go to his page and you basically have a personal coach, but at a much better price point. That is. Yeah. I've mentioned this in other episodes, I think, but I think like with weight loss, with uh, um, sports education or sports courses, stuff like that, I think a common theme is that people need like personalized help, right? Or they need like accountability with these types of things where it's like, yes, the general tips and the general videos help everyone. But the thing like the true premium offer, I feel like is like, hey, I'm going to give you personalized advice. And that seems to be a nice theme that a lot of like uh, coaches, for lack of a better better term, can really implement. You know, for start like any day, starting from day one, even. Um, True. Yeah. Anything else to add, Thomas? I guess that's a wrap. That is a wrap. Thank you guys for joining us on this episode. As Thomas mentioned, we did want to keep it tight, keep it under thirty or so minutes, just to see how that plays. If that was a little more digestible, a little more enjoyable. Let us know. There's a lot less banter. By the way, Jonas was not on this episode, um, but he will be back next week. And if you guys did like this episode, please give it a like, give it a rating, five stars on whatever platform you might be listening to it on. Give us a subscribe. Check us out on YouTube. Um, you know, subscribe, like, it really helps us out. Costs you nothing, just, just a couple of clicks. And uh, yeah, Thomas, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Take care. We'll see you guys next week.